Welcome to this course from the Hyatt Institute. This course is called America's Christian Birth, The Untold Story. I am your teacher and narrator, Dr. Eddie Hyatt. I'm so glad that you're a part of this course. This course, the information is so very vital and important for this time in which we live. Now, uh, as I said, the uh, the name of this course is America's Christian Birth, The Untold Story. And I want to just quickly go over the five lessons that are in this five-lesson course. Lesson one is called The Original American Vision. Lesson two is called The Great Awakening. Lesson three is called Slavery and the Great Awakening. And lesson four is A Nation is Born. And we could say out of the Great Awakening. And then lesson number five, America's Founding Fathers. This is lesson four, a nation is born. A nation is born out of the awakening. Uh, the late pro professor, uh, Harvard professor and historian Perry Miller uh, made this statement. He said the Declaration of Independence of 1776 was a direct result of the preaching of the evangelist of the Great Awakening. So true. The textbooks for this course, 1726 and America's Revival Heritage, they are available from Amazon and also from our uh, bookstore at eddiehyatt.com, www.eddiehyatt.com. Make sure you get the second edition of America's Revival Heritage. Well, the first, the official founding of this nation. The nation uh, as a nation was born. Before this, they were just 13 scattered British colonies. But as a nation, they the, the, the beginnings we can trace back. Of course, we trace the birthday of 1776 when they actually, for the first time, published the Declaration of Independence on July the 4th, 1776. But uh, if we want to talk about the very beginnings of the forming, we need to go back two years earlier to 1774 when the first Continental Congress met together in Philadelphia at Carpenter's Hall. And there you see a drawing of Carpenter's Hall, a small, uh, very insignificant building. Uh, this nation had very humble beginnings. And uh, the reason they had gathered together they met to discuss how to respond to the intolerable acts. That's what they, they were called throughout the colonies, imposed by Great Britain, which included oppressive taxes and regulations without any input or recognition of rights on their part. Now, King George, uh, he did not see the colonists as citizens. He saw them as subjects and saw them as a source of revenue. So he began to impose all sorts of taxes on the colonies without any input from them. They, ha they had no choice in it. And, and these taxes were on everything from tea to sugar to writing paper, uh, and, and, and then all kinds of regulations. He also sent over officials and set up custom offices in different cities uh, to, to collect these taxes and uh, sent British soldiers over to protect the custom officials. And so this was, this was very odious uh, in the sight of, of the colonists who had pretty much lived freely on their own with with a huge Atlantic Ocean between them. And this was before modern means of communication. So they met to discuss how to respond to these intolerable acts being imposed upon them by the British crown. They also met to discuss the fact that after protest erupted in New England, King George had sent four regiments of British soldiers who occupied the city of Boston and shut down its port and revoked the right of the people of Massachusetts to self-governance, to govern themselves. In other words, uh, King George sent his own officials to govern uh, New England and, and the, the Massachusetts colony. Uh, British ships had also shelled the port city of Charleston. Now, you know something of, of the protest in England uh, the one that is famous is what's called the Boston Tea Party. And you see what had happened. Uh, 
King George put a tax on American tea. There was no tax on British tea. And so if people, and so there was a ship from Great Britain loaded with British tea and they were ready to unload it and distribute it to the merchants. And so the merchants were going to be able to sell it for much less than the American tea because the American tea, he had already imposed a tax on the American tea, putting the prices up. So what it was going to do, it was going to put the American tea companies out of business. And so there were 50 patriots, and I understand they were led by Samuel Adams. They dressed as Indians, and they boarded this tea ship, and they took the cases of tea and threw them overboard in the Boston in the Boston Harbor, and it became known as the Boston Tea Party. Well, these kind of protests infuriated King George, and so he sent four regiments of British soldiers. They occupied the city of Boston, closed down its busy port. Uh, they boarded their soldiers in people's homes without the people have any kind of say in it. So th th they realized something. How are we going to respond to all of this? So this was some of the reasons, the main reasons for this first Continental Congress gathering together in Philadelphia in 1774. There were 56 dele delegates uh, present from all 13 colonies except Georgia. Some of the better known names in attendance were George Washington, Richard Henry Lee, and Patrick Henry, who were from Virginia, John Adams and Samuel Adams from, from New England. But of course, there are many others there whose names are not so well known to us uh, today. Now, they decided that they would open their proceedings with Bible reading and prayer. Now, why would they do this? Hey, they have all been impacted by this great awakening. And so they decided they, they're going to start their proceedings with Bible reading and prayer. So they invited an Anglican, an elderly Anglican minister there in, in Philadelphia who had a reputation of a man of piety and deep spirituality. So they invited him to come and to open their proceedings with Bible reading and prayer. And so he opened the proceedings Jacob Deuce did by reading the entire, not reading a verse, but the entire 35th Psalm. And it begins with these words, plead my cause, O Lord, with those who strive against me, fight against those who fight against me. And as we're going to see, this had such a powerful impact on those who were gathered together in that building. After reading the 35th Psalm, Douche began praying for America and especially for the people of Boston who were under siege by the British. And there is an artist rendering you see of, uh, of this group at prayer. Some are kneeling. Uh, this would probably be the Anglicans. The Anglicans, it was their custom in church. I don't know if you've ever been in an Anglican church, but they have, uh, they have rails padded rails to kneel on because when there's prayer, it's their custom to kneel. Um, the, the Quakers, the Puritans, they did not necessarily have that custom. They would kneel in prayer, but it wasn't a custom that was necessary. And so many of them, they sat and prayed, but their hearts were all one together praying for God's intervention for the people of America. This is a this is an excerpt from the prayer. It's not the it's not the complete prayer, but this is an excerpt from the prayer that Jacob Douche prayed, and other people that were lifting up their hearts to God as well. And he said, "Oh Lord, now we could call this America's founding prayer. Oh Lord, our high and mighty Father." And you'll you'll see there there is no political correctness here, in in this prayer. And when we look at these these early founders, we see how far America has strayed and drifted and gone away from the principles and 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 the the vision of of our founders. And he prayed, "O Lord, our high and mighty Father, look down in mercy. We beseech thee on these our American states, who have fled to thee from the rod of the oppressor, desiring to be henceforth dependent only on thee." That's a powerful statement that they desire to be dependent only on God. 
He says, shower down upon them such temporal blessings as thou seest expedient for them in this world and crown them with everlasting joy in the world to come. All this we ask in the name and through the merits of Jesus Christ, thy son and our savior. Amen. America's founding prayer was prayed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So there's a, there's a, the artist rendering a larger uh, picture of it, the artist rendering of these of the Continental Congress at prayer. Uh, by the way, fr from from th from that time on, uh, they opened every one of their sessions. They 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 met for over a month, daily sessions, and every one of them were opened with Bible reading and prayer. And there's some very interesting. I have John Adams, uh, one of America's most fo prominent founding fathers, and his wife Abigail Adams. Uh, because he wrote a letter about the impact of the Bible reading and prayer from Boston to his wife back in New England. And he said in this letter, he said, who can realize the emotions with which they turned imploringly to heaven for divine interposition and aid? It was enough to melt a heart of stone. So all of those present are being very powerfully impacted. No question that the, the, the presence of God was manifested there in their midst. He, he went on to say in the letter to his wife, Abigail, it seems as if heaven had ordained that psalm to be read that day because it was, so, it was a psalm of David praying for God's deliverance from his oppressor. And, and, it, and it just seemed, I'm sure the Holy Spirit made it alive, it just seemed so appropriate to their situation and the situation of America at that, at that moment in time. He says, I never saw a greater effect upon an audience. Isn't, isn't this amazing? Now, he was a person who attended church regular, uh, but it wasn't, and, and he'd heard Bible reading and preaching and prayer in church. But he said he had never seen a greater effect upon an audience than he did there in that first Continental Congress. It seems as if heaven had ordained that psalm to be read that day. I saw tears gush into the eyes of the old, grave Pacific Quakers of Philadelphia. I must beg you to read that psalm. Here we have the official beginnings of America as a nation. In this first Continental Congress, America is being birthed in Bible reading and prayer. We could say that Christianity is in our national DNA. That is why we need to take a stand for righteousness and Christian truth in this day in which we live in which there are so many attempts to remove all Christian influence from, from, um, from American life and the American arena. This is the time, my friends, for us to stand up and take action. The Second Continental Congress convened on May 10th, 1775, because nothing had really changed. Um, King George had moved forward, sending more governors, more tax officials, custom officials uh, to the colonies. And, uh, uh, and, and then there were, th th there were physical scuffles breaking out. In, in Boston, there was what was called uh, the Boston Massacre, where several people were killed by British soldiers. Um, there was, were some of the colonist protesters started throwing snowballs at the British soldiers and it escalated and they opened fire and there were a number of people killed. And so uh, things have continually gotten worse since the first Continental Congress convened and ended in October of 1774. So less than a year later, they convened a second Continental Congress and, and it was obvious that war was breaking out, that George was gonna be sent, continue to sending, King George sending troops to America and they decided we need to defend ourselves. So they chose George Washington, unanimously chose George Washington to be the commander in chief of the Continental Army. Now you have to realize that these were just some local 
regional militias. They were a ragtag bunch um, using their own rifles because there was no federal government to tax the people, to raise money, to equip the army. So they had to use their own guns. They had to uh, uh, survive on donations from people, from any wealthy Americans. And so they were quite a ragtag army, especially compared to the British military, which was at that time the most powerful military force in the world. So in the natural, it looked like they didn't have a chance. But uh, Washington accepted this call to be commander in chief of the Continental Army, and he accepted the call as a sense of duty and refused any salary. Now, Washington created a praying army. He knew that in the natural, they had no chance whatsoever against the British military, the most powerful military force in the earth at the time. And so he immediately issued an order that each day was to begin with prayer, led by the commanding officer of each unit. He also forbade gambling and profanity and expressed his desire. This is his quote, that every officer and man will endeavor so as to act and live as a Christian soldier. Henry Mullenberg was a pastor of a Lutheran church. And, um, uh, one year, I think it was 1775, uh, Washington and his army were quartering at Valley Forge in Pennsylvania. And uh, Henry Mullingberg lived right next door to their camp, and he was able to observe uh, things that were going on. And he wrote one day, he said, Washington rode around among his army yesterday and admonished each one to fear God. Oh, that we had a military like that today. We would not have nearly the issues and the problems that we are facing in this nation today. Washington rode, a, rode around among his army yesterday and admonished each one to fear God. Washington was also known as a man of prayer, personal prayer himself. This, this painting, which is quite famous, is based on a true story. There was a an individual, and I'm just going to read uh, what he wrote in, uh, and this is in the book seven, uh, 1726. Isaac Potts was a Quaker. Now remember, the Quakers were pacifists. They did not believe in war. They did not believe that you could be a Christian and a soldier. They believed that 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 the Bible just totally um, uh, outlawed and uh, excluded any kind of war. But he tells about, he told about that he was riding his horse one day through the woods, and he said he heard a sound of prayer. He said, I tied my horse to a sampling and went quietly into the woods, and to my astonishment, I saw the great George Washington on his knees alone, with his sword on one side and his cocked hat on the other. He was at prayer to the God of the armies, beseeching that God would interpose with his divine aid as it was ye crisis and the cause of the country, of humanity, and of the world. So Washington had a, had a sense that this was very important, which is one about these little British colonies, that it was the cause of, of the country, of humanity, and of the world. And he goes on, he says, such a prayer I never heard from the lips of a man. I left him alone praying. I went home and told my wife I saw a sight and heard today what I never saw or heard before and related to her what I had seen and heard and observed. We never thought a man could be a soldier and a Christian, but if there is one in the world, it is Washington. <laughs> so my friends, this is a praying army. They're ragtag. They don't have the equipment. They don't have the armaments, but they have something the British did not have. They had a praying commander-in-chief who was also encouraging them and, and commanding them to pray. And so, uh, and also between 1774 and 1783, 1774 was when the, the Continental, First Continental Congress uh, began, 
And during the Revolutionary War, which which lasts for about uh, eight years, 1775 to 1783, the Continental Congress issued no less, it could have been more, but no less than 15 national calls for the people of the, of, of the American colonies to set aside a day for humiliation, fasting, and prayer for God's assistance in the war. And so by humiliation, they did not mean a groveling. They did not mean a self-flagellation beating up on yourself, but an acknowledgement of how much they needed God. No thumping their own chest, no sticking out their chest. Look who we are. No, there was to be humiliation acknowledged. God, we desperately need you. We don't have a chance without your help and intervention. <laughs> and so during this war, not only was, was Washington praying and his army praying, but the Continental Congress was issuing calls for days of prayer and repentance and fasting. Wow. One of the miracles that's told about, the, it's called the Miracle of Long Island. In the early part of the war, Washington and his troops found themselves trapped there were about 12,000 of them trapped on Long Island. Now, Long Island is just off, off the coast of New York City. And, and between Long Island and Manhattan is, is the East River. And so they found themselves trapped on Long Island by British force at least twice their size. And the British had them pinned against the East River. And the British were so confident, hey, we're going to put an end to this this colonial rebellion. So they decided that they would wait. It was late in the, in, the, in the evening. So they decided they would wait until the next morning to march forward, pin them against the East River and force them to surrender. However, during the night, the Americans prayed. They used the weapon of prayer. They prayed and sent out a desperate call for boats to carry them and their armaments across the East River to Manhattan. As dawn approached, it was obvious that they were not even close to completing their task. However, just before the sun came up, a heavy fog rolled in, wherein one could only see a few feet in front of himself, and the British could not advance. The Americans, however, continued moving men and cannon across the East River, and as soon as they were all across around noon, the fog suddenly lifted, and the British looked. They were astounded. It looked like the American army, 12,000 people with cannon and armaments, it looked like they had disappeared into thin air. <laughs> but this was an incredible answer to prayer, which, the, 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 uh, which George Washington and the early Americans saw so many of those in this war, for this defensive war for independence. This Washington, this 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 um, army was also an interracial army, and it, it's no doubt that it was a result of the Great Awakening, and the abolitionist movement, the anti-slavery sentiments that were released, that Washington instructed his recruiters to receive free blacks into the Revolutionary Army. This resulted in one in every six soldiers being of African descent. This is important to note for blacks and whites fought together for freedom from the British. The Declaration of Independence. Now, the, the, Continental, the Continental Congress decided, okay, it's time that we make a declaration of our independence from Great Britain. You see, in a sense, they're legally, officially, they're under the British crown. And so they decided it was time to officially declare their independence from Great Britain, and a select committee of five, which included Benjamin Franklin, was chosen to assist Thomas Jefferson in the formulation of this document. This document is called the Declaration of Independence. It was officially published on July the 4th, 1776. This is important. The founding document anchors individual rights not in any human government or institution, but in God. The Declaration says, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, 
and are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, such as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So our rights are not given to us by government. You see, the founders understood that government existed to protect the rights that are already given to us by God. And I am amazed at how people that I would think would know are so ignorant and uninformed of these facts. I heard a, there was a discussion on one of the news programs, I think it was MSNBC, and there was a uh, a woman who is a journalist with a, um, uh, I believe, with, with Politico. And, uh, and in this discussion, they were talking about, and they thought this was so far out, about these, these Christians who believe that their rights come from God. And I thought, have these people ever read the Declaration of Independence? Of course, that, that's, that is an American thing. It's in our founding document. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights such as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now think about this for a moment. This is important. The 56 signers knew that they would be targeted by King George who would view their act as an act of treason, punishable by imprisonment, and or death. Yeah, they were putting everything on the line by signing their names to this document. They were putting their lives, their their well-being, their properties, their their uh, their holdings. They were putting everything on the line when they signed this document. They therefore ended the document with the following words: "And for the support of this declaration." With a firm reliance on the protection of providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Well, incredible. Now, they were targeted by the British. After this was made public, five signers were captured by the British and were tortured by the British as traitors. Nine of these signees actually fought in the Revolutionary War and died from wounds or hardships. There may have been more fought in the Revolutionary War, but, but there were nine of them that died fighting in the Revolutionary War. Two lost their sons in the war, and two others had sons captured by the British. At least a dozen of the 56 had their homes pillaged and burned by the British. But none of them went back on their pledge. John Adams, who's one of the signers, and he's writing this in light of the sacrifices that, that they are making. They, they're, they're putting everything on the line. He said, posterity, you will never know how much it costs the present generation to preserve your freedom. I hope you will make a good use of it. Yes, we must stand for the freedoms that these people stood for, for us. The Declaration of Independence, because the document states that all men are created equal and contains no classifications based on race or skin color, many, I would say pretty much the whole founding generation, considered the Declaration to be a statement against slavery. And abolitionists used it in their fight to abolish slavery. For example, at a gathering of Methodist leaders in Baltimore in 1784, they issued a statement denouncing slavery as contrary to the golden rule of God, the unalienable rights of mankind, that is right out (laughs) of the Declaration of Independence. They use that word. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. So they said slavery is contrary to the golden rule of God, the unalienable rights of mankind, and every principle of the revolution. They said it's not only contrary to the word of God, it's contrary to the principles of the American Revolution. Well, and then Frederick Douglass, the famous former slave 
and um, uh, uh, abolitionist. No one was more scathing than Frederick Douglass in his attacks on slavery and on those who, who tolerated slavery. But he recognized the significance of this document. And he said this was in a speech in 1852. He said the principles contained in that instrument are saving principles. Stand by those principles. Be true to them on all occasions, in all places, against all foes, and at whatever cost. Wow. Colorblind founding documents, neither the Declaration of Independence nor the uh, U.S. Constitution ratified in 1787 contain any classifications based on race, ethnicity, or skin color. The word slave and slavery are nowhere to be found. Uh, James Madison is usually considered the chief architect of the U.S. Constitution, which came together in 1787. But he commented on this, that they didn't use the word slave or slavery. He said the convention thought it wrong to admit in the Constitution that there could be property in men. Wow. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. understood the power of these founding documents. In his I Have a Dream speech, he said, when the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and Declaration of Independence, they were saying that black men as well as white men would be guaranteed the unalienable rights which come from God, the rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Wow. In his same speech, he said, I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. In other words, he did not want to dispense with the founding documents. He wanted the nation to live up to those founding documents, to the standard that the founders gave to us. He wanted us to live up to them. Oh, how we need to live up to the standards that Jesus gave us, that God gave us, and as well to the standards in our founding documents. Independence is gained. Through God's help, the war officially ended on October 19, 1781, when the British general Cornwallis surrendered his entire force to George Washington. What an incredible day that was. Washington then appointed Israel Evans, a chaplain in the American army, to deliver a Thanksgiving sermon to the troops that same day. Word spread of what had happened, the surrender, and so people you can imagine the excitement as the word spread and people, multitudes, thousands came and gathered together and were there when Israel Evans uh, shared this sermon. So uh, Washington then appointed Israel Evans, a chaplain in the American army, to deliver a Thanksgiving sermon to the troops that same day, which was attended by a massive crowd. One of the things that came out of that sermon was a poem and as far as I know, that Israel Evans composed it, and um, this is and, and it was it was later published and widely spread around. This is not the complete poem. The complete poem is in um, the book 1726, but I just pulled out an excerpt here for this slide. To him who led, th this poem shows that they were giving all the glory to God. They were not taking in credit for themselves. They knew that God had brought them through. He says, to him who led in ancient days, the Hebrew tribes, your anthems raise. The God who spoke from Sinai's hill protects his chosen people still. Not in ourselves success we owe. By divine help, by help divine, we crushed the foe. Folks, this is America's founding. This is how this nation came into being. George Washington, now that the British had surrendered, he resigned his commission as the commander-in-chief. Um, he sent a letter to the uh, Continental Congress resigning his, his position. And then he sent a letter to the governors of all the individual colonies, which are now American states. And in this letter, an amazing letter, he includes what he calls his earnest prayer for them. And interestingly, he wants them to make Jesus Christ their model. <laughs> Listen to this. And, 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 and of course, the, 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 a more complete 
uh, expression of this prayer is found in the book 1726. But he says, I now make it my earnest prayer that God would have you and the state over which you preside in his holy protection, that he would incline the hearts of the citizens to demean ourselves with that charity, humility, and pacific temper of mind, which were the characteristics of the divine author of our blessed religion. And without a humble imitation of his example in these things, we can never hope to be a happy nation. That's a powerful statement. That if we don't seek to imitate Jesus Christ and his teachings, we can never hope to be a happy nation. Well, then George Washington made this statement. This was shortly after, a few years later, when he was made president. He says, it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey his will, to be grateful for his benefits, and humbly to implore his protection and favor. Yes, yes it is. So true. So a nation is born. I love that hymn. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans white with foam. God bless America, my home, sweet home. Wow. And so, folks, let's pray. This this was America's founding. This was America's beginnings. A nation birthed in Bible reading and prayer. And let's pray for another great revival, another great awakening to roll across this land, that those founding principles will be renewed across this land once again. I'm Eddie Hyatt, and I'm so glad you joined me for this lesson. Um, Lesson five, if you're if you're taking these in sequence, you still have lesson five, and I know it's going to be a great blessing to you. I want to, I want to pray for you, those of you who are studying. I, I, I sense the presence of God in my heart so strongly. Lord, I thank you for everyone who is taking this course and who has just listened to this lesson. God, I pray that you will use them, that you will fill them with your Holy Spirit and make them a powerful witness for you and make them instruments of revival, calling this nation back to those principles on which she was founded. And we thank you for it in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you.